Welcome and thank you for being a part of the Gender Institute's launch event. Uh, we're thrilled to have Professor Ann Foster Sterling here and get to ask her some questions about her research, her career, and thinking about gender um, in academia and beyond. So welcome, Professor Foster Sterling. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this event. We are thrilled to have you, and I think I'll start out with a question that we often ask our guests, which is, what got you interested in the study of gender? Uh, I got interested in the study of gender because of my political activism. Um, I, you know, I was going to school in the 1960s, so that kind of says it. I was a 60s girl. <laughs> Do you still see activism as a key part of your gender-based work, or do you see the research? What's your feeling about activism now? Um, well, for myself, I would probably define activism in terms of my work. That is, I think that my work uh, contributes to the needs of activists, and I think that doing academic work is an important piece of doing good gender activism. But I'm I'm less often found on a picket line than I was when I was 25. But not never. <laughs> Always a good thing. Um, yeah. Most people in gender studies aren't biologists. How did those two things come together? So I was a biologist first before, because I'm old enough to have existed with a life before the women's movement. Um, and so as the women's movement grew, I was faced with trying to integrate my life, integrate what I did in the laboratory. It had integrated what my knowledge base was with, um, with my activist self and with the needs of, of the women's movement. What advice would you have for people now interested in studying at the intersection of gender and biology? Well, learn both. That is, you have to learn feminist theory and you have to study biology so that you know both fields. You have to bring them together. And I'd also say that this is now an area where there are a lot of people doing just that. So it's you, you don't have to invent it. I had to invent it. Um, but there are now programs that do it. There are labs that focus on feminist, um, feminist biology. There's the field of feminist science studies. There's a whole lot of different ways you can, you can just do it, and it's somewhat ready-made for you. Probably in the last decade, there have been a whole lot of kind of growth in the movement of women in science and making sure that women are part of panels and being a part of publications. Uh, have you seen anything in those movements that you find particularly successful or that you want to challenge? Um, that's, a, that's a tough one. I don't do a lot of that kind of public participation anymore. I'm not on panels much. I don't go to scientific meetings if I can help it. <laughs> um, and uh, I, but I, I think it's one piece of the work that's important. Uh, and I'm glad to see that there are, are people continuing to work to make to make it happen. I mean, I do think the the time is done for us to say, well, we have one woman on a panel of five people, and so we're good people. Uh, I think it should become more and more automatic that that there's a reasonable mix. It doesn't have to be 50-50 down the middle, but, uh, but I hope the day will come when getting the right people doesn't mean, as it was in my early days, finding the right man for the job, but finding the right experts for the need. And you have a new book, right? Either recently out or coming out? I have an old book that with a new edition. Okay, tell us a little bit about it. Okay, so the book is Sexing the Body, Gender Politics and the Construction of Sexuality. And I wrote it originally in 2000. And in the new edition, I've added a new chapter, uh, which sort of brings people up to date on how I'm thinking, thinking about 
sex, gender, and sexuality these days. I also added in a kind of update on various themes that I developed in the original book. Uh, so the new the new book is is has significant new material in it, or the new edition does. And who do you hope? Who do you hope learns from the book in terms of readership and people to push your agenda forward? Well, the book is used a lot in women's studies and gender studies courses, at least in the U.S. I don't know about Great Britain. Uh, and it has been translated into a few languages. I'm always ready for more. But uh, so I think it gets used quite a lot by students and then the occasional lay reader who isn't in school uh, around uh, really around the world I think it's it's used quite a lot and one of the main arguments you make is about the ways in which the relationship between sex and gender is often misinterpreted could you tell us about general misinterpretations and how your work kind of fixes that well I'm not sure my work fixes it but uh, what <laughs> What I, and I'm not alone in this, and several other scholars in gender studies and biology have started doing is using a new, is using a new compound phrase that, um, that I pronounce gender sex with, um, with an emphasis on the first part of the word, but I consider it one word. And that's because I think that the distinction between sex and gender is an almost impossible one to maintain if you understand the body as in constantly reacting and changing to the things it has experienced. Uh, so you don't, there's no such thing as sex hormones, in fact, which is something I argue even, argued even in 2000, but even the hormones that we associate with, uh, with being of higher concentration in men compared to women, for example, are never, a known concentration, they are only a concentration of a certain sort in the context of the behaviors of the of the person whose body they are in. So, for example, testosterone levels decrease in men, and I'll, I'll have an example of this in the PowerPoint on Thursday, decrease in, um, in men who are involved in uh, infant care compared to men who are not. So the gender part of that is a culture or situation or context in which men are doing childcare changes their body and changes aspects of their body that we normally associate with having to do with quote sex. So I, I think the term sex almost doesn't exist outside of the, of the social world and experience of the body. And um, nor does gender alone exist outside of the body. So I want to give a tip of the hat to both terms, but I think they can only be understood together as a unity. Your work has always been very pioneering in convincing people that there aren't just two sexes or two genders. Uh, can you tell us how that fits into your work? Well, that was very much a part of the um, of the work that I did in the first edition of Sexing the Body, where I wanted to explore the whole question of what social construction means if we're talking about um, about biology. And to do that, I looked at the question of uh, the development of um, of intermediate forms, so-called intersex, and how the medical world addressed the existence of such human beings, how, how they addressed them when they were born as babies, how, how they tried to figure out how to handle them um, as, uh, as they grew into children and adults. And what one sees is that we have a, cata a binary set of categories into which a non-binary group of possibilities uh, tries to get fit. And whether you think of it as a continuum or a set of discrete categories, um, the main point is that, that as a culture, we primarily try to use two categories and make everybody fit into them. 
Okay, so uh, now uh, a number of people have kind of started the trend of identifying their gender pronouns when they identify their name. Yeah. Um, how does that, does that kind of uh, address some of your concerns or how do you feel about that? Uh, I mean, I feel fine about it. I think that if it, if it helps people clarify their stance in the world and their place in the world, um, if if they are unhappy having been misnamed, I mean, I used to get misnamed when I was a, a young scientist. But this was this is so way before the days of online anything. Uh, really, the use of computers by uh, by anybody. And there used to be this system where people would send each other through the mail hard copy reprints, and you'd send out postcards to people saying, could you please send me a reprint of your um, of your article, such and such, published in such and such a paper? And I would get these reprint card requests addressed to Dear Sir. And it really made me mad. And I, that was an example of being misgendered, not in the way that it it has to do with the trans move, trans activist movement now, but sometimes I would ignore it, and sometimes I would cross it out and send back, send return the postcard saying, "Please call me by my proper name." And you know, it it did depend quite a bit on my mood, um, and maybe I had too much time on my hands, <laughs> but um, but I think that letting people know what pronouns you want to want to be addressed by is a fine thing. And I don't see any reason not to respect a person's desire to be, to have pronouns used the way they wish them to be used. You've done some work on sex, gender, and early childhood development that I think might be kind of new to some of the people watching this. Could you tell us a little bit about that work? Well, I will be telling you a lot about that work ah. on, on Thursday. I mean, that really will be the main the main thrust of what of what I have to of what I have to say. But I'm really interested in how gender is part of the world of an infant's world from even before birth, and how how it might be communicated uh, through the daily activities of feeding and diapering and talking to a baby and playing with a baby. How that um, how gender becomes part of a baby's world and how they um, how they then absorb it from the world long before they can express their own sense at age three or older of who they think they are. Well, I look forward to seeing that in your talk. Good. Um, okay, just a couple of last questions. The first is, uh, do you have advice for students getting involved in the study of gender now, things that might be interesting to study or uh, life pro tips or something like that? I don't, and here's why. I think that the things that interest students who are, we don't even want to say how many years younger than me, uh, are going to be different than what interests me. I mean, I have a bunch of things I, I'm still very interested in and I'm trying to write about and follow up on, um, but they aren't necessarily what moves the 18-year-old or the 20-year-old or the 25-year-old. And so my only, quote, pro tip is if something real, if a question is really driving you, study it. So what are you working on and writing about now? Well, it's it's a follow up of the work I'll talk about on Thursday, uh, but I right this minute I am trying to to do qualitative rather than quantitative studies uh, analyses of these tapes I have of mothers and infants interacting, um, in in order to see more clearly how worlds of narratives of gender begin to get formed in the um, in these early days. And this has led me down a little bit of a rabbit hole in a paper I'm trying to write now um, that talks about how we as scientists narrate the interactions. So how we are, and, and in qualitative science, the 
the observer is not, um, you know, a, an observer from without looking down, not, not D- Donna Haraway's God's eye view, um, but is in there narrating and has their own their own point of view. So I've started to write this paper about what it means to narrate or how infant development has gotten narrated and how gender has or hasn't gotten narrated. Um, And that's gotten me a little bit into the history of child psychology, which is a a fascinating little rabbit hole that I'm right in the middle of now. Then I'll have to pull out of it and then see how I pull it all together. So I guess it's a theoretical paper based on these observations I'm trying to make. Okay, and um, then one last question that we try and ask everybody because we get such different and interesting answers to it, which is um, if you could name some of your intellectual kind of heroes or people that you were indebted to intellectually or uh, that your work was inspired by, uh, who would you tell us about? Um, I'd tell you about Esther Thalen, who um, has was the person who really brought dynamic systems theory to the fore. Um, I was also, as a younger person, definitely inspired by Karl Marx. Um, There are probably other people in there, but those are the two that come to mind spontaneously. Uh, Thanks, we appreciate it. And we look forward to hearing your talk on Thursday. Okay. I look forward to giving it.